This is the final week in our um, first series of a year-long study uh, called The Story of God through Genesis and Exodus. The first series on beginnings, and we've spent six weeks in the first chapter and a half, two chapters of the first book of the Bible. And I've said this almost every week, but it's still so true. I feel as if we're just, every, every week there's so much, to, the big challenge for me each in preparation for the sermons is what not to put in, because there's so much information in these, we're, we're only still scratching the surface. So far in these first few weeks, we've been discovering that God is the creator of all that exists. Everything holds together by a word of his power, the scripture tells us. He spoke the universe into existence. He spoke you and I into existence. He, he creates by, by his voice. He's the eternal self-existent one, not dependent on anyone or anything. All things depend on him. And that he created everything good. All the, the stars in the heavens, the sun and the moon, land and the sea, fish of the sea, birds of the air, beasts of the field, all good. And then he created us in his image and breathed the breath of life into our nostrils. And we're made in his image to reflect his image in the world. And God saw everything and said, it's very good. And we've been really sprinting through this series so far. So many foundational truths. And here's, so, uh, so by the way, if you've, if you've not yet uh, taken the ch- uh, opportunity to sign up for the book club, it's not too late. You can read along on your own. If you don't have time, if you're not a sit down and read kind of person, we have recorded all the readings so you can get online and download those podcasts or those MP3s and listen in your car. But I want to encourage you. What we're being taught in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on is absolutely foundational stuff to your faith. If you don't understand these truths, then everything that comes after them won't make as much sense to you. The gospel uh, doesn't begin in Matthew 1, it begins in Genesis 1. So if you've not done that, please jump in and join. If you want to join a book club, I'm sure there are those that still have room for you to join as well, because many are are reading together in community. Uh, In fact, when I was walking down the hallway on my way up here from the downstairs, I I passed by a a book club meeting just tonight before the service. It's really encouraging, and so I want to encourage you to get involved, because this is God's story. It's our story, and it's to be your story as well. So today, we come to the story of the first wedding day. Remember, how many of you are married here? Remember your wedding day? You better say yes, right? Right? Is my wedding, I think, oh, look at that. She looks the same. If she was here, I'd say it. My wife looks, I don't look the same, but she looks exactly the same as our wedding day. Beautiful as ever. Let's just leave that up for the rest of the evening. You can stare at that, be distracted. Uh, When you look back on your wedding day, we're looking back on the very first joining together of a man and a woman. It comes to us in Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. You can follow in your own Bibles or on the screen, but I'll read beginning with verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And that's how chapter two ends and we'll stop there. I don't know if you caught how the passage started. Did you catch it? This passage But the first wedding day, joining of a man and a woman, begins with this statement of God, it is not good for man to be alone. That's actually a fascinating statement if you think about it. Not good. It's the only thing, only time we hear any not good before the fall, before sin comes in. Everything else is good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. But this is not good. We got to pause there and think about that for a minute. Think about it just for a minute. Adam is living As a sinless man, in a perfect, uncorrupted creation, in an uninhibited relationship with the one in whose image he's made, his creator God, sinless man, perfect relationship, perfect world, and yet something's missing. And yet God still says, "Mm, it's not good. 
Something isn't quite right. We're not quite done here. What is it? First thing I want you to see here is we were created for community. You're created for community. What's missing? Human relationship on the macro level. We'll talk about man and wife in a minute. But at the very least, it's not good for men, man, woman. And the word man, the word Adam is the word ha-adam. It really means like mankind, humanity, people. It's not good for us to be alone. Why do you think when you, when you watch prison movies, they put them in solitary confinement and nobody cheers? That's punishment. It's not good to be alone. Sociologists, secular psychologists do studies about what happens to us in, in extreme isolation for long periods of time, and it's never good. You never come out better than you went in. I'm not saying there aren't times in your life when you're stressed out and want to withdraw from people and get off your phone. You should do that. That's not what I'm talking about. We're not meant to live alone, isolated from each other. God says it's not good. Now, before we get into the husband and wife and the marriage thing, I want to say a word about singleness. For those of you who are here who are not married, perhaps you were and it ended badly. Perhaps you long to be someday, or you're, not, you're questioning if you ever will be. If you're here and you're single, it's important for you to hear me say this, because the church has not always done this well. Sometimes I think we've unintentionally communicated to people who are not married that you can't be a whole person unless you find that special other, and it's not true. You can perfectly fulfill all that God meant for you in your life on your own in relationship to him and other people. You don't have to have a spouse. Jesus, the perfect man who ever walked the earth, wasn't married despite what the Da Vinci Code says. Was never married. Paul, who wrote three quarters of the New Testament, not married. So it's important that we, I think we have to say, we're created for community, vertical community with God and horizontal relationships with each other. Now, we're going to look at how marriage is one answer to this lack. But you can be fully human and fully honoring to God without being married. Because as wonderful as marriage is, it's not the ultimate fulfillment. It's not the end. It's not the perfect relationship, despite what Hollywood tells you. We were created for community. In verse, the second half of verse 18, God says, not good for man to be alone, so what? So I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. The word helper is an unfortunate English translation. Because if you hear helper, what do you think? What you, servant. You think about someone to help me, right? Uh, tell the help, to clear the dishes, that kind of thing. That's not at all what the word means. The word in Hebrew is the word ezer. And it's, it's used 22 times in the Old Testament, only three in reference to the first woman, and 16 times in reference to God himself. In fact, the name Eliezer, Eliezer is the word Eli, Eli, L-E-I, prefix for God, Azer, God is my helper. 16 times this word is used of God. He's not our servant in the sense that he's below us, right? This is in no way a demeaning term. That's not at all what's being taught here. Let's look now at the design of marriage. The design of marriage. The Bible progressively reveals and affirms the fact that God designed marriage. Genesis 2, the second chapter of the first book of the Bible, the beginning of the story of God, it's right here. Jesus later looks back to this and says, haven't you read in the beginning he created the male and female? And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother be united to his wife. Therefore, what God has joined together, he says, God, what God has joined together, let no one ever separate. God designed marriage. It is not a cultural invention. It is not a human, uh, um, we didn't, to help, invent it to help societies or for rearing children. God ordained it and designed it. I know this is being redefined in our culture. I know it has been redefined in our courts. I'm not talking about the political system of our world. I'm talking about God's intent from the beginning. And if you're here as a Christ follower, this is your authority above all other authorities. And God defines it. And since God designed marriage, it takes three to make a good marriage, not two. Did you know that? A man, a woman, and a household pet. No, right? Although, not cats. Dogs are better. But a man, a woman, and God. This is what it means when people come to me and say, would you do our wedding? Would you officiate? Which is a weird title, right? I kind of have a whistle. Officiate our wedding. What are they saying? We want to be married in the eyes of God, not just the eyes of the state. We want God to be the center of our relationship. In fact, when I talk to couples whose marriages are in crisis, it's always, if you peel back enough layers, it's always because one or both have moved away from God or moved God out of the equation. It's his design. 
So a key part of understanding God's design, I think for us, is the story of how God created the woman. It's fascinating to me that in the story of the first marriage is also the story of how God fashioned the woman. We know he made the man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, but he makes the woman in a different way. I think that tells us something very important. Let me look back here for a minute. It won't be on the screen, but I'll read for you. Verses 19 and 20 about how God does this. In verse 19, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field. But for Adam there was no helper found fit for him. Do you think I find this curious? Why does God do it this way? Why did God put Adam through all this? Why this parade of animals and the naming business? First of all, just as an aside, I know Adam didn't speak English, but what was that like Why, when Adam named them? Did he start off with like cat, dog, ant, and then later was it like hippopotamus, rhinoceros, like, well, you know, I know that he's speaking English, but like, I would like to have been there, you know, and God's going, okay, if you want to call it that, we'll call it that, right? I mean, and was, or were they really looking for a mate? Didn't God know the giraffe wasn't going to be a suitable helper? No, 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 you know? Why did God do that that way? I think God is teaching Adam and us a very important lesson. Think about it. They're all passing by. Adam's naming them. And he's noticing as, the, as they're passing by, there's a male and a female. There's a gendered pair for all of them. And then it comes to the end. Don't you think he's going, hey, wait a minute. Where's mine? What about me? I'm alone here. This explains his reaction in part when he finally meets the woman made for him. This is the setup for what God's doing. He brings Adam to feel his lack, his not goodness, to sense his need. And why doesn't God just make the woman out of the dust like Adam? Why does he make her out of his, why does he put Adam down for a nap and like, like divine anesthesia and pull out his rib and why do it that way? The word in Hebrew for rib doesn't necessarily just mean rib, although it very likely could have been, but it means side, it refers to the side of a person. The point I think here for us is she's not made from his foot beneath him, nor his head above him but equal to him from his side to be with him. She's made that way. And God doesn't like put her down for a nap too and they both wake up and go, hey, who are you? Like, you know, do you notice how it's done? I think it's just so beautiful and tender. God wakes Adam up and then what does he do? He brings the woman to him. The imagery is like a wedding day, like a father walking his daughter down the aisle, his precious daughter to give her away to her husband. That's the imagery here. God, how, just, just pause for a minute there. What does this tell you of the character and nature of God? That he does it this way. How tender is he? How good is our God? He delights, I think. I think God delights in blessing his children. And seeing them over, overwhelmed and overjoyed with his creation and what he's doing for them. Ephesians 5 tells us that as husbands, we are to love our wives as our own bodies. I think it's a reference back to how he made the woman out of himself. God made woman, and literally said, the word is sometimes translated fashioned. The Hebrew word actually means built. God built her. God built her. You could say and be theologically accurate that the first woman was very well built. Just making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Notice how, how, how Adam responds, right? The passion in his voice. He says, this at last. Finally, now. There's an exclamation, right? Because what's he been longing for? What's he been looking for? Not for me, not for me, not for me. Where's mine? Ah, at last. She shall be called woman. Why is she called? I know this is a joke, but I like this joke. Why is she called woman? Do you know Why? Because when Adam saw her, he went, whoa, man. Right? Come on, that's funny. I know, maybe just to me. Actually, the Hebrew word for uh, uh, man is ish. So he says, in Hebrew, the word is, she shall be called ish shah, for she was taken out of ish. She's, she, in other words, she's of me. We're meant for each other. 
unlike any other part of creation. You know, the first human word spoken, the only human word spoken that we get a record of, clearly Adam was naming the animals, but we don't get any, any recorded words of any human being until after the fall, after things go south, except for right here. The only recorded human words prior to the sin entering the picture is Adam's response when he sees Eve. It's a love poem. It's a song. At last, this is for me, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. The first recorded words are a song of love. Again, what does this tell you about our God? In verse 24, God says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Have you ever found that curious? Who are, who is, are the father and mother that Adam is leaving? A man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. Well, who, they don't have, he doesn't have a father and mother. Now, of course, Moses was writing this, and he's writing this to an Israelite audience, but still, what is this telling us? God's design for marriage, I'm going to say it in a simple statement, is to be a primary, exclusive, permanent relationship between a man and a woman. It's to be a primary, exclusive, permanent relationship between one man and one woman. Let me talk about those words in succession. Primary. It trumps the parent-child relationship. I shouldn't say trumps. It, it, it supersedes. Right? The parent-child relationship. Think about it. A man must what? Leave his father and mother to be united to his wife. In other words, there must be a severing to a degree, cut the cord we say. There must be a breaking, a distancing, a changing of one relationship in order for, for another one to, to come into being. You can't become a husband or a wife if you still stay connected to your mother and father the way you did when you lived in their home. It doesn't work like that. There's going to be problems. A man must leave his father and mother physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and cleave is the old King James word. It sounds like a weird guy's name, though. Cleave. Hey, Cleave. But it, what it means is to cling to, to be united to. So in other words, the marriage relationship is primary even over the parent-child relationship. Now, in our culture, I, I'm a dad. I have three beautiful children. I love them dearly. I was at my son's college football game before I came here, and I just love just being around him, and I don't get to do that as much anymore. It's hard to imagine a stronger love than the parent-child love, Right? I think our culture gets this wrong. I think, and I see in my own life and in, in many of your lives and the lives of the people that we interact with, in our suburban, wealthy suburban Chicagoland culture, we, you know, once upon a time I was in love with him or her, but then we had children and now we're pretty much just partners in running the family business and our whole self-esteem and our whole sense of who we are is caught up in the success of our kids. But the Bible says this is to be a primary relationship. Nothing's to come between. First, second, only to relationship with God. We struggle with this concept in our culture. You're not helping your marriage, you're not helping your kids if you make those relationships number one. Second, it's to be exclusive. An exclusive relationship. Think of it like a circle. If I was to have my wife, up, Jim and Mary are here and they're friends, but uh, if I was to draw a circle around them, right? Jim, Mary, God, inside that circle, nobody else. My wife and I, our circle with God in the midst of it. No one else is to be in that circle. There's a circle around our relationship that's, that's protected, that's sacred. And I also see this in, in marriages that are in crisis or having difficulty, is that people start moving toward the edge of that circle. If you think of the stage as a circle, they move out. They move out until it's way farther to go back to the center than it is just to step out the circle to stay in the center of that relationship, and no one else gets in there. You, men, for a minute, since I'm a man, I'll talk to you men, husbands, husbands-to-be. You should not have, and you should not tell secrets about or from your wife. You should not keep secrets from your wife, you should not tell secrets about her. You should not have a relationship outside your marriage which is more intimate than your relationship with your wife. Now, I'm not saying there aren't certain things you say in a certain way because you want her to understand, and she, and she does that for you, but this is the circle. This is the primary relationship. This is the exclusive relationship. Nobody else gets in there. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Fused, in other words. 
The two shall become one. Third, it's to be permanent. Leave and hold fast. Unbroken. I know in our culture we make and break promises all the time. In businesses, in politics. Breach of contract is no big deal in our culture. But this is God's design. It's to be radically different. In Matthew 19, 6, this is why Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is God's intent. A man and a woman to come together, to be in a permanent, exclusive, intimate, primary relationship, to love and serve each other. You know, God, God gives them work to do prior to the fall. Work's not a curse. It gets corrupted like all things do after we sin, and we'll talk about that next week. But what's the, what's the woman to help him with? And what's he, what, are they, what is the point other than childbearing and rearing? For the man and a woman to come together un, under God's grace and to help each other become the people that God meant for them to be. In our culture, marriage is a fluid concept, individually defined, redefined, fought over, debated, but rarely respected or revered in our homes. Good marriages, not perfect, there's no such thing, biblical marriages, are the result of a willingness and a commitment by a man and a woman to work at these things. Prim primacy, permanence, exclusivity, intimacy. They're not the result of our feelings or our compatibility. I talked to a man in my office years ago who, I've told the story before, but he came to me and he said, you know, I, I, I think God wants me to leave and get out of this marriage. It's not good for me. I said, really? You're sure this is God? I said, yeah, tell me about that. Well, doesn't God want us to be happy? And I haven't been happy in this relationship for many, many years. And I think God, it's just better for everyone if I was to get out because I'm not happy. With all the love of Christ in my heart, I wanted to reach across my desk and choke him. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't, not really. A little bit. But I would never do that. It's not about your happiness. The fastest way to an unhappy marriage and an unhappy life is to focus on your happiness. The beautiful irony is when you focus on the other, on loving and serving the other person in a marriage or in any relationship, you find fulfillment when you get your mind and your eyes off of you. And we, we're so focused on this. I, I see it in my own life, and I see it in the people that I talk to. How's he treating me? How's she doing? Is she being a submissive wife? Is he being a respectful husband? And we're, we're fixated on what we perceive the other person is not being or doing for us. It's the wrong focus. Good marriages are not the result of good compatibility or how you feel in a moment, but a commitment to what God has laid out over a lifetime, regardless of how you feel in any given moment. This brings us last to the meaning of marriage. The meaning of marriage. There is a strong tendency, I think, in our culture to make idols out of marriages and children. My spouse will complete me. Jerry Maguire said that, or she did. It's a lie. Your spouse will not complete you, not ultimately. My children will fulfill me. Also a lie. As good as marriage is, uh, as marriage is and as high a value as Scripture places on it, it's not the ultimate. It's not the ultimate relationship. Gary Thomas has a book called Sacred Marriage. I encourage you to read it, married or not. Uh, and, in, and his premise or thesis in this book is, God has not given you marriage to make you happy, but to make you holy. And there's a vast difference. Becoming holy means becoming like God, and that's a painful process which would mean by definition that a relationship with another human being over a lifetime that's primary, permanent, and exclusive is going to be difficult. Marriage is not an end in itself. It's not an ultimate desire. It's intended by God to be a picture of how our ultimate fulfillment is in Christ. Think about this for a minute. Jesus, he's a pretty smart guy on a human level. On a divine level, he's omniscient. So he has all of the universe from which to draw a metaphor to describe his love for his people, the church. I don't just mean this church. I mean all those who belong to him in the world. There are shepherds and sheep metaphors, vine and branches metaphors, but the primary metaphor Jesus uses to describe how much he loves us is bride 
and groom. Isn't that beautiful? It's bride and groom. This is how I love you. Like my, like my beautiful bride, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, Paul says in Ephesians 5. I want to present you to myself. Marriage is meant to point us to God. It's meant to point our hearts to the ultimate relationship. And so if you're here and you're single, you should pray, you should seek God to, and ask him to bless the marriages that you know. Because they matter. Here's why they matter. When a man and a woman come together and love and serve each other, surrender their hearts to each other, put the other person's needs ahead of their own and, their, and that relationship second only to Christ in their hearts, when they forgive each other, serve each other, stay together even when it's difficult. You know what that is, what, what, what's happening there? That's God giving the watching world a little picture of his love in action. A little window into which to glimpse the goodness of God. Not perfect, none of us are perfect. Don't you think our world needs more little windows? Our world needs more little glimpses of the goodness of God in action? So whether you're married or not, pray for that. The best, argument, the best argument we could make for the biblical ideal and design of marriage is not policy. It's not theological treatises, although those are more important. It's to live it out. It's to live out what God has said to us in his word. That's the best apologetic. The Bible, by the way, did you know, begins and ends with wedding imagery? Genesis 2 all creation's good. One thing missing, though, man is alone. I have a solution. And he brings a woman to the man. And there's a wedding in Genesis 2. And God is smiling on it. By the way, Christians are sometimes, this is a little bit of an aside, but Christians are sometimes accused of being sexually repressed. You know, pent up, nervous, uptight, prudish. I don't think so. If you read this story, you've got a naked man singing to a naked woman and God's smiling on the whole picture right? They're naked and not ashamed. God's going, this is good. This is good stuff. And then in Revelation 19, in fact, you could trace the story of God with wedding imagery. Here's a couple of examples for you. In, in, in Genesis 2, we read in Matthew 19, I've alluded to this, Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And in Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying it also refers to Christ and the church. And then at the end of the story of God in Revelation 19, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Isn't this awesome? We're, our focus is not to be on the, on the quality of this earthly relationship in the moment, but on what God has given it to us for as a picture to the world of his love, of what is coming someday. Husbands, when you love your wife as best you can by God's grace, you're, in act, you're acting that out. Wives, when you love and respect your husband as best you can by God's grace, you're acting that out. The world's getting a glimpse. Because this relationship in Revelation 19 is not just for the married people. There'll be no giving and receiving of marriage in the heaven. We're all going to be united to our groom, to the one who made us for himself. And that's a day worth looking forward to. That's a day worth celebrating. Now, I know some of you are here before we close. And the truth is, this is a painful subject. You've had marriages, I know some of you, that have ended badly. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that's not how it worked out for me. Others of you are hoping someday and wondering if it'll ever be true. Whatever category you find, or maybe you're in marriages in crisis right now. I, I want you to, to be encouraged by this. This is not a, an unattainable, perfect standard God's given us. It's a beautiful picture of how he designed it. So if you're not in a marriage relationship, pray for those who are. Pray for your own heart to be united to Christ so that if and when that day comes, you're ready because you have that first relationship rock solid.
And for those of you that have been through pain in marriage or are in now, God's grace and hope can heal you as well. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for this foundational truth that here in the very beginning of the story of, of, of who you are and who we are, we see that you designed marriage. It is not our invention. It is not our convention. It comes from your heart to us. So for those of us who are married or soon to be married, God, help us to live out this beautiful picture. Imperfectly, yes, but still by your grace to increasingly love and serve each other. For those here who are hurting, God, heal them and remind them that you have not abandoned them. You will be the perfect spouse for them as well. And we look forward to the day when you will claim us all as a husband claims her bride. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.